Hey everyone, it's George Kroos with another episode of the Innovators Mindset Podcast. I am with my buddy here, Wesson Kieschnick. And nailed it. If, did I nail it? Perfect. Yeah, you so nailed it. I actually uh, referenced Weston in a podcast I just did. And it's great because I actually have him here. We're going to talk about some of the things that uh, we talked about. And I referenced, I had no idea to see, say his name because <laughs> it's like Keith Chin Chinnick. Dude, I've, I've, I've heard every possible iteration of there's that a, name. There's a lot of like, there's a lot of consonants I feel. And it's, name, it's, so. it's literally, it is every bit German and it's just a bunch of consonants with one or two vowels just all <laughs> mashed into each other. Yeah. But now I got it. Keishnik. Yeah, my wife was super happy to get that name, by the way. Yeah, just real thrilled about it. It's actually like, it's way easier than what I made it out to be. I don't know. I was like, I think I was adding it like an R somewhere. Mm -hmm. and Most people, it, there's nothing phonetic about it. And then when you say it out loud, it's like, oh, that's easy. But then you look at the spelling <laughs> and realize it's like, no, it's some drunk German was just like, yeah, that'll be the name. <laughs> that's, I love it. Yeah. Well, Weston, uh, I actually have met Weston. I don't even know, like, I think we've only met in person once, but we've connected yeah. a ton. And um, he actually wrote um, Bold School, uh, which we'll talk a little bit about, but he also has a new book coming out with his wife, Molly, correct? Correct. Molly, Molly Kieschnick. Very good. Oh, I'm just so going to say it over. I'm going to like yeah. try to get it in as many times as possible. Um, and that is called Breaking Bold. So we'll talk more about that. But Weston, thanks so much for joining us. It's actually, we talked for about half an hour. I asked you to do this like an hour ago after I sent you my podcast that I talked about a tweet. And we're going to talk about that. Um, and just uh, thanks for being on here. And just can you just share a little bit about kind of your journey in education and like how um, you're doing what you're doing today? Yeah, so my, my journey into the field that I'm in right now is really odd. My ambitions in education began and ended with, I wanted to teach high school and I wanted to coach high school football. And that's all I ever wanted to do in education, right? Um, uh, what ultimately happened was my second year as a classroom teacher, uh, I went to a conference, this literacy conference in Orlando. And you know how it is, like when you're a classroom teacher, you got to go to the conference and you got to come back and you got to present your 15 minutes of what you learned. Like that's how they make it worth it, right? So I presented my 15 minutes, unbeknownst to me, a principal had invited a neighboring principal from another school to come and see a different part of the staff meeting all together. Uh, she saw me do that 15 minutes and was like, hey, that was good. Would you mind coming and doing that 15 for my teachers as well? Uh, and the school was uh, right, down, uh, right down the street. And so I was like, yeah, no problem. She had invited another principal. Long story short, I ended up doing some version of that presentation about a half a dozen times. So then all these principals got together and they were like, hey, we should just send this guy to conferences and we'll all split the cost and we'll have him come back and present to all of us. And so they broached uh, me. Awesome. Uh, that, uh, yeah, they approached me and they said, hey, we've got this idea. I was a second year teacher. Like I didn't have any money to like travel. So I was like, yeah, I'll absolutely do this. Like it was not lost on me that these guys are essentially pimping me out for, for professional development. <laughs> but in my mind, I was like, this is a win-win. And so that's, that's how I got started in the field of adult education until eventually uh, somebody doing professional development said, hey, you should do this like during the summer for extra money. And I wasn't as a teacher familiar with this concept of extra money. So I was like, yeah, you had me at extra, like no problem. Uh, and then I just kind of, I, I fell completely up the stairs back to this field. Well, actually, when I, when I saw you, we were in Hawaii, which was awesome. Yeah, it was great. Uh, and I, 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 I came early um, to see you to speak. And I was, I was truly blown away. I loved uh, the way you told stories, the, the really powerful ideas that you shared. And I actually remember, I, I think you were talking about like a teacher, you know, at the early part of your career that really influenced you. Right. And I still, yes. I actually still remember that. And that was like almost, I think a, like almost a year ago. Can you tell a little bit about that story? Yeah, so that was my, uh, my cooperating teacher, my mentor teacher that I had as a student teacher. Uh, guy's name was Kirk Daddow. And long story short, like I was like every single like uh, brand new teacher going in thinking like, oh, I've, I've read some books. So now I know some stuff. <laughs> and it was literally the story of me teaching my first class ever. And it, is, it was a complete bomb, an absolute complete bomb from start to finish. It was a disaster so much so that like when it was all done and the bell rung, like the kids are standing up, they're walking out of the classroom, like shuffling out super quietly, like because they know I must be humiliated. And when they walk out and the door closes, like I look back at my cooperating teacher who was 
Uh, he was the head football coach at the school at the time, like a couple years away from retirement, gray hair, mustache. And he leans back in his chair and he folds his arm and, and forgive me, he looks at me and he says, well, that was <laughs> right. Just, just nails me with it. Uh, but then proceeded to give me the greatest gift that I ever received as an educator. Uh, and he coached me up, right? Like he, he, he pointed out like, hey, like you're doing this, this and this. Have you thought about this, that and that? And he continued to coach me up, coach me up, coach me up. And I'm, I'm a firm believer that not a single one of us gets out of this profession alive, much less has any sort of success without the benefit of some really great coaching and mentorship. Uh, and Kirk Data was that person for me. Well, it's, it's funny because I think about, I was actually just wrote about this. I think about early in my teaching career, some of the stuff that I did and like want to go back. I think every teacher wants to go back and apologize. And apologize. Right? Like, say, yep. Oh my God, like what did I do? But I, I think it's really kind of listening to a story. One of the things that's funny is I know that I bombed some classes, but it didn't take me until like four or five years after. I'm like, oh, that was bad. But like I that, think that, that one was really bad. But I think that's more normal. I think that's right. more normal than my experience where a person looks you dead in the eye <laughs> and tells you exactly what they thought about it, you know? Um, and I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to sit here and debate what's better or, or worse, but I, I think your experience is a, an entirely normal one. Yeah. I, yeah. That was, yeah. I still look back. I'm like, Oh my God. That was do, you, do you ever, did you ever see any of those kids that you taught in your first two, three, four years as adults? Oh yeah. I actually connected with a lot of them on Instagram and um, it's funny because I, like it's something that like I was just thinking about this, that even when you think at your worst, you're still making a difference, right? As yeah. long as you're focusing on relationships and focusing on connecting. And so I think about like curriculum stuff. I, like, I know this is going to sound horrible. I didn't even know like where to find the curriculum. I was just like, Hey, I got a textbook. And yeah. so if I just do that, I'm good. We're right. Good. And, it, but I really went on my way to connect with students and like some of them have connected me, you know, with me and they're, you know, not that much uh, younger than me now and just said about, you know, the influence they had and you're like, Oh my God, like I was, I don't know how it does and make you even, feel even at our worst, even at, our, I think even at your worst as an educator, um, that time where we really struggle with some of those things, as long as you keep the connection and the relationships at the forefront, you're still making a difference. Totally. And I'm, I'm a firm believer. And I would say this to new teachers or anyone who's in like a speaker role and does something like what we do now. Like I'm a firm believer that whenever anyone leaves you, like they should know something, but they should also feel something. Right. And I feel like those first few years as a teacher, like the feeling part was the only thing I really got right. right. You know what I mean? Like I, I knew enough to know like, Hey, build relationships with these kids, like make sure they feel good about themselves, that they feel confident, that they feel like I believe that they can succeed. And I got that part right. I don't know if they learned anything relative to the curriculum or the content standards, but it's, it's, I feel like it's everyone's, you know, greatest challenge to make sure that pendulum doesn't shift so much where it's just like kids are coming in and now they're only going to leave and right. know something and they're going to feel nothing about you. Or well, is that, I remember. So when you told that story and I actually was able to see you before I was actually working with the group. And I'm like, hey, you remember that story that that person gave you feedback? Well, I'm going to give you some feedback and then actually talk to you. And the reason, and we were talking about this before we got on the podcast, um, I saw Wes and I was just blown away. But I, even when we're at our best, I think we can all grow. The, the luxury was I actually spoke after you, then I left after. So that, that, was, that was a luxury. <laughs> I'll, I'll tell you, super intimidating, super intimidating and <laughs> I was like, oh, I'm going before George. Hopefully he'll go like grab a coffee or something. Well, like, no, you stood right there and you watched every part of it. And then I was like, well, I, I hope he stays. Oh yeah, no, it was yeah. great. But like we, we were talking about how valuable that is. And one of the things that I see is really important for the work that I do today is I want to make sure that everyone I connect with, I can help them grow too. And I think a lot of times um, we, we, we don't, and it's, I think what I, I didn't just say, Hey, Wes, and like, here's what sucked. Right. Like I was like, Hey, I love this. I love this. I love this. And genuine, not like, I'm going to, but here's some things just for you to think about and you can take my advice or leave it. And like, just, we were talking about that and just like share some of your thoughts about that, that when we first connected at the time, cause I know you shared like it stuck with you after. Yeah. So, so number one, you absolutely did broach it uh, with, uh, grace and humility in a way that I could receive it. Uh, you did much better than my mentor teacher and my cooperating teacher did. So, 
So, so I picked up thing, in that story, so that's why. Yeah, exactly. It's like, oh, well, maybe I could just tell this guy exactly what I think about him. No, you, you were more gentle. Uh, but, you know, you and I have talked about this. Like, that was, such, that was such a valuable moment of feedback for me. And I think, uh, I think anyone, when you get to any sort of stage in your profession, uh, in any sort of uh, level of, you know, decent competency, you get to a place where you hear a lot of good things uh, uh, about what you do. And you hear a lot of things that reinforce preconceived notions uh, about what you do and how you do it. And I think it's so valuable in those moments where a person can engage with you in a conversation, a person who also has talent and say like, hey, have you thought about this, this, or this? And I, and I think it's important as professionals that we have our ears open to that. So I remember one of the things that we talked about was, you know, when you're standing in front of a group of, of kids or adults, anywhere in between, like when you're teaching something, like it can't all be warm bath, right? It can't all be like, oh, this makes me feel good. It reinforces everything I already think about myself. Like there has to be an element of cold shower, something that's abrupt that causes a person to think differently uh, than they potentially did before, or at least try to sort of like have an internal argument with you in, in your head. Uh, and that's, that's stuck with me for a while. Uh, and, and I'll tell you, it's made, me, it's made me a better speaker. It makes me better at what I do. It makes me a better teacher. Uh, and again, my, my ears always perk up to moments like that uh, when I can engage in a dialogue that may be contrary to what I think about myself or what others have said about me. Yeah, and I think for me, this is the reason I wanted to kind of talk about this is because one of the things that I know this maybe sounds weird that it, this drives me crazy is when a teacher says, oh, that principal is so awesome. They just let me do whatever. Right. I'm like, mm, is that like really helping you? And I'm not saying like, of course, the autonomy is really important. But is it just like, hey, I'm just totally going to so remove myself from the situation that I actually... I'm not going to help this person grow. And I think a lot of really great educators leave schools because they feel they don't have mentorship anymore. They feel like this is the max that I can grow in this space. So I'm going to go somewhere else. And, but then there's the other end of it too, where it's like someone just says like, Hey, like you suck. And here's why. And like, why are you not taking my criticism? Well, you didn't actually do anything to build a relationship. And one of the things I always kind of talk about is this idea of like, you build the relationship so you can challenge. So you can help that person grow. So they know it's like, Hey, like I'm pushing you because I believe in you and I have your back. And I think that to me is something that, you know, that always bothers me when I, when I hear it. Cause I'm like, what are you losing when you actually have someone who has like, I just don't want anything to do with you. Just do whatever you want. What do you lose out on that situation as a teacher? Yeah. Not only what do you lose out on, but what do kids lose out on? Right. Because I think you arrive at a point where you either stagnate or you get worse. So I'm interested in that. My wife and I have talked about that on our podcast as well. Just the notion of like receiving feedback yeah. and who you can receive feedback from. And I, I think there are some prerequisites that have to be in place for you to be able to even receive feedback. Uh, because give, for as much as giving feedback is a skill, receiving it is a skill too. And uh, I, I think when you're talking, so I think back to when you gave me that piece of feedback, right? And I'm like, mm -hmm. okay, what, like, what did you have? What did we have that allowed me to receive that feedback? Like you hit on relationship, right? But I also think the person offering the feedback has to have a certain level of skill or competency for the other person to, to receive that. I, I can't tell you, uh, the number of times I've watched bad teachers, uh, and, and I struggled to even say that phrase, but you know what I mean? Like you've watched bad teachers try to give feedback to master teachers. And I'm just like, yeah, like, I hope you don't right. listen to that a, because there's no relationship there and B there's not enough comp, there's not enough mutual competency for that to be useful for you. Yeah. You know, I, I think that like, you know, in different parts, and I think one of the things that I try to strive in was there's certain things that I was really good at in the work that I was doing that other people struggle with. Right. And so there are certain areas that I know that I struggle with where they, I, you know, I try to get better at taking their feedback in that area. And I think part of it is seeing people have different strengths and abilities in that process. But there's like, even you using the term feedback is because there's a difference between well, can't you take criticism? And I think criticism, right. like when we talk about it, it's really to kind of end the conversation and actually show like a dominance in some spaces. Right. But feedback is for about growth. And when I hear, like sometimes when I actually hear that, that notion, 
like I think about in the context of kids, like, are we giving kids criticism or feedback? Because I think just the insinuation, I don't know that I don't have the definitions in front of me, what they technically are. But feedback for me is something about moving forward. But there has to be, like you said, there has to be certain things in place before that can actually happen. Yeah. And you, you talked about you talked about kind of, so I'm a firm believer that you're like the average of the five people in life that you surround mm-hmm. yourself with most. Uh, and I think that exists, you know, sort of like professionally in terms of like what kind of father I want to be. And so I think really long and hard sometimes about the people I surround myself with and I associate with and have conversations with, uh, because I like to make sure that number one, those are people I have great relationships with and people who I respect, but also like I, I look really closely for people who have skills in areas where I have deficits right. and that that necessitates a certain level of, of self-awareness that's it's hard to come by for me and for everybody uh, on a lot of different days well I want to show you one place I have a strength at uh, I was reading the only, sweep by, only one just no just this one because this one's oh, okay. gonna really this is gonna hit home I was reading this tweet by Weston Kieschnick oh yeah <laughs> did you hear how I hammered like just nailed that one uh, that was a good, that, that pronunciation was really good. It was strong. <laughs> I've been practicing, so. Yeah, I could, you've been practicing on this <laughs> podcast. <laughs> I have. I, like I told you, I'm going to get it in as many times as possible. I know, I so, know. So, okay, so on Saturday, uh, just this past weekend, I saw this tweet. And there, this is why we actually had this conversation. Like, I reached out to you, and I did a whole podcast on on Weston Kieschnick's tweet. So good. And. I challenged it a little bit, but not really, because I know Weston, I know really how he believes. And I was like wondering if there's like a terminology difference because uh, Weston lives in the US, I live in Canada. And I'm just going to read the tweet and I would actually ask Weston if we could kind of talk about this. Because I know like, because I said, hey, I'm not going to post that if you're comfortable with that, because I think when you actually, it's really thoughtful of how we challenge people online. And I think that we have a relationship and I know that. And plus, like I, like, I wanted to make sure in the podcast, for those who have listened, I also say how awesome you are, which I truly believe. I, and, I, you know. and, that's, and that's what I was going to say. I was like, to be perfectly frank, you were super tame in how you, in how you broached the conversation. And it wasn't even a on, criticism, really. Like, it wasn't no. like a challenge or it was like. And you, and you led into the tweet with so much praise. <laughs> it was really difficult for me to even possibly be a little bit mad. Uh, yeah. And yeah. then, and then what you said, I almost entirely agree with. And okay, so let's, okay, I'm let's excited to, to talk about it. Let's get to it. Okay, so this is the tweet. Uh, COVID nineteen has proven accountability is not the driving force behind great teaching. Remove state tests, teacher evaluations, and even grades in some cases. What happened? Teachers are working harder than ever. So the the part that I totally agree with, and I actually talked about. And I don't know if you had the chance to listen to the whole podcast or just where I, I totally wrecked your name. I listened just until you it. said my name wrong, and then I turned it off. Yeah. <laughs> and then I, and then so I said, let's, I, do, I agreed, let's right? do it again. I, I agreed with the second part. Teachers are working harder than ever. But the one analogy that I talked about was, I think that like the hard thing for me is that saying like teachers are working more than ever because it's like they're, they were already working 100% all the time. But it's really challenging with all the different routines that we have. And like, that's a shock. You know, people are doing very different things which is really overwhelming. But the part that I kind of dug into was the term accountability. And when a lot of educators here, and I think it's partly, you know, as I'm talking about this, because I didn't really say this in the podcast, we have been just kind of like brainwashed that accountability is about state tests, is a co- So we see that word um, as like connected to this like thing that's not really power, powerful. And I actually said, well, I actually think it is the accountability that is actually driving this work, but it's the accountability to kids. It's yes. the accountability to each other. And I know like you have a tweet and I guarantee you probably didn't even have like, there's no way you could have, like you would have had to do a thread. You'd have been yeah. threading to kind of go through that. I, I was, I was actually uh, laying in my bed before I sent it. And I was like, how is George going to interpret <laughs> this? Which that is last not, which, when which I saw I him, all my tweets <laughs> when I saw him that last time he didn't hold back so like yeah. really like having you on now like I know and just tell me what you think about like kind of what I talked about in response to your tweet so I was I was in total agreement and I started to think about the notion of accountability right mm. and 
there are two types of accountability, right? There, so there's extrinsic accountability, yeah. uh, your, your uh, uh, state assessments, your teacher evaluations, like all of those are very extrinsic. And then there's intrinsic accountability, which is what you're talking about, which is accountability to your students and to your craft. And, and those, right. that sort of accountability has always been there. And I think that sort of accountability has always been the driver. Uh, part of what my point was, was in, in sending that tweet was to say like, we have so many extrinsic accountability measures and we've placed so much weight on them right. that when we focus outward on all of these extrinsic accountability measures, it's easy to get disconnected from that intrinsic accountability that should be the driver behind what we do. And I think it's good for all of us to see uh, from practitioners to school leaders mm -hmm. to district leaders to say like, hey, I, like, we don't need to worry that if we move these extrinsic accountability things that all of a sudden like motivation will decrease. Like, no, accountability still exists. And we need to make sure that teachers are able to reconnect uh, consistently with sort of like the things inside them that drive them. And I think the, I think one of the points that I tried to make in that, and it's great because like there's a difference between me just talking it out and actually having a conversation because I'm learning about some of the things that you're sharing because I don't think any teacher starts off thinking about that, but how people lead, they start looking at accountability as to just the tests and just those things. And my belief, and I know this from listening to you, and kind of what you believe, like we understand those things still exist. They're not going to go away, even though they might be temporarily going away. But the idea of that, are you as in leadership, like totally murking the waters of why educators got into the profession in the first place? Because I think that was like, like the whole process was just for me to talk it out. And I think that's where I really have the issue because the term accountability when it's said from central office or from district administrator is exactly the way used in the tweet. But when we really talk about what matters and what we should be accountable to, I think that gets lost so much in, in education and it's I, not by I, teachers. No, I, and, and I, and I totally agree. And, and so it, it not only get lo gets lost, like that sort of like individual accountability sort of gets like stomped out. Right because we get so worried about this thing. And, and I, always, I always wanna be really careful too. And anyone who's seen me say anything in any forum whatsoever, like I'm always super nervous about these big pendulum swings that we're always so susceptible right. to. So the easy thing to do is to read that tweet that I put out and say like, yeah, Kishnik says we should get rid of state testing and teacher right. evaluations totally. and grades. It's like, that is, that is not, oh, that's 100% not what I'm saying. Uh, yeah. What I'm saying is, like, we have started to value these things to such an extent that we've made it really difficult for teachers to connect with intrinsic motivators and intrinsic accountability systems. And I think there's got to be some some better balance that we can strike now that we've, I mean, think I, I just talked about this in a webinar. Think about if a year ago, we would have said, like, hey, let's take away all the state tests, teacher evaluations, and grades, and let's mm -hmm. just see what happens. Let's right. see if people stop teaching. Like, that... That, that would never have been an experiment that would have flown. Right. But that's what we did this year. We took away all those things. And I think we have to take a good, long, hard look at like what we learned out of all this. Yeah, and I think like as when I was sitting this tweet, and I know like we're talking a lot about a tweet, and I actually love when people post something like this and you really think about it. And like, I did a whole podcast on it. There's a blog post kind of talking about the podcast. I was really thinking about like, when do I, when I use the term accountability, when I talk about it, what do people not, what do I mean? What do people hear? That was something that I was really cautious of. And when he tweeted this, I wasn't like, Oh my God, this is, I was like, so like, what, it, like, no, we are accountable though. And I like, it really pushed my thinking. And I love when that's in a blog post or a tweet, AJ and I, Giuliani, were talking about this, you know, this really kind of, awesome time when we were actually like you know talking about a tweet and really trying to dig in but really honoring the person because like i know you west and i know everything that i said in the podcast i know you agree with because yeah I, I know the value put on how important educators are in the lives of students and really focus on that purpose that deep purpose of what we do 
but do we actually create situations where educators actually lose their purpose in their work? And so as kind of, kind of jumping into the, the, to, you know, just talking about some of the work that you do, um, I read Bold School. I don't have a copy of it here with me because I'm in my office. I'm sorry, buddy. But because it's because it's because it's framed. It's on the wall. You don't want to take yeah, the right. picture down it's and break. Such I appreciate a pain. That. Yeah, it's such a you. pain because like I actually we um, nailed it to the wall just to make sure that <laughs> yeah. it nail, never moves. Right, nail through the forehead part. Uh, hold on, before <laughs> before before we move on, talk about that. I, th I think you said something, and it's it's my hope that. Uh, it's a place I hope we return to just in social media and how we engage in the virtual space. Like, I, I think what you said is a really healthy way to look at social media. And I hope we arrive at a place we, where we start to look at it that way, which is like, you know, a tweet is not a definitive statement that encompasses oh, yeah. holistically all of my thinking or your thinking or anyone's thinking about a particular topic. Like ideally, like when social media is at its best, it's exactly what you said. Like it's a jumping off point. Like it's a spark. It's not the whole flame. It's, you know, like I, I just, I wish, I wish more people understood that and used it as, as a platform for authentic conversation, respectful conversation, as opposed to like, wait, this is what Weston thinks. Awesome. That's stupid. I'm on, yeah. I'm on board too. Or man, this guy's an idiot. Let me go podcast about it for 17 minutes. Yeah. And I just like, like, honestly, I like, so we're recording this. You posted that on Saturday. Yes. It is four days later on a Tuesday. And I, I know I, it's weird because I was like, oh, should I podcast about that? Like, should I talk that <laughs> out? Like, it took me like four days of pondering it. And I like I just, saved it in a folder. I just and like, I, like it made me really think. And I love that. Like, like, I always say, like, when you think like a tweet can't say something. Yeah. But like, it's funny because I agree. It's like, I actually totally agree with the tweet as well. Yeah. Right. Like, it's not like I like, oh, I hate what you said. Right. But really for me, one of the things that I'm really adamant about in my work is that that processing time to like think about stuff, dig into it and try to create something of value from it is what I try to do with what you're saying. And it, like, it was, it, it was like good to talk it over with you and share it. I, I agree. And the, my biggest takeaway is it's just comforting for me to know that with the right 140 characters, I can live in your head for four days. That gives me a, a lot minimum. Of minimum. <laughs> I can't guarantee that I'm not going to be like thinking about this for a week after. I love it. So, I love it. <laughs> anyway, so let's talk a little bit about um, old school, which I, you know, you talk about kind of, you, so you talk about the, the notion of blended learning, old school, and really kind of talk about like, and I know that it's, the book has resonated with so many people, but I also think right now, um, with all of this stuff with like the term that I've been using is this is not like blended learning. This is not virtual. It's emergency remote teaching. And I've been saying that over and over again, not my term. It was read from a blog post. So like, how is the concepts of what you talked about and talk a little bit about the book, but really how they apply to like what's going on right now? Yeah. So it's, I, I was lucky enough to write the book, write book at the right time. Uh, so bold school, the notion of what it means to be bold school, bold school is just a mashup of the words blended and old as a constant reminder that in all of the work that we do, it's important that our old school wisdom as educators uh, is not just sort of like tossed out like baby with the bathwater style. Like we have to bring that old school wisdom, the things that we know uh, authentically work with kids on the path to uh, forms of blended and online and remote instruction. And that, that applies now more than ever because as we start to think about what it looks like after we sent all of our kids home, uh, what it uncovered for us uh, in a lot of different cases was that we were operating from this space where we had uh, a, a tool surplus and a strategies deficit relative to pedagogy, right? And so like, we've got our flip grids and we've got our Nearpods and we've got our Google Classrooms and we got all this stuff but we can't just throw stuff at the problem. Like the challenge for us is how do you take those new school tools and within the confines of Zoom, do reciprocal teaching, which we know has an effect size greater than seven tenths. Kids can grow almost two years over a single academic year's worth of time. How do we make sure that this platform is a two-way medium as opposed to a one-way medium where we're just telling kids information? You know, how do you, how do you conduct Socratic seminar within a flip grid? How do we make sure that we are uh, utilizing key vocabulary strategies within the confines of uh, a collaborative Google slide that we're pushing out with students? So all of those things factor into what successful remote learning should look like, sound like, and feel like. 
And the nice thing is we can do all those things by leaning into some of that old school wisdom. And when we're back with our kids in a brick and mortar face-to-face environment, like all of those things are still applicable. It's not like we have to learn new things that we're going to have to ditch. Yeah. The, and like what I appreciated really about listening to you reading the book is one of the things that I have really worked on to get better at is I used to say, and I, I, you probably were guilty of this too, maybe not, but I know a ton of people listening are, is I used to say the term traditional, but I you, would mean bad. Like, yes. oh, like our traditional, you know, Holy our guilty. traditional. Yeah, and like you say that, but there's like one of the things that you do really well, and I try to do really well in my work, is we tell stories. It is mm-hmm. the most traditional teaching strategy. It is the oldest tre- teaching strategy there is. It is still relevant to this day. So really kind of identifying like some, there are a ton of traditional practices that are actually really good to this day and are effective for kids, but don't use the terminology traditional for bad, but also there's some new things that are out there that are not good. And so the new does not equal good either. And so that's what I really loved about the, the, the concepts there is really kind of honoring some of those things, but really in the focus of helping kids because- well, Go ahead. Sorry, Wes. I, I, I was like, I like, I wrote bold school. Yeah. Selfishly, I wrote yeah. it. I'll admit, I wrote it completely selfishly because as a as a teacher, I was so tired of sitting in professional development, and all I was hearing was everything I wasn't doing right, and right. how everything was that was new was so much better than anything that I had done, and it was all about innovate, innovate, innovate. And I'm a firm believer that any good professional development that you sit in and any good coaching that you receive is a good mix. It's that, it's that, you know, cold shower, warm bath is a Mm -hmm. good mix of innovation and validation. And that's all bold school was. It was like, Hey, I need to make sure that our practitioners feel validated because they've been doing great things with kids in our classrooms for a really long time. And they need to know that. And they need to know what they are and they need to know why we know they work while at the same time pushing us to innovate because our schools do need to be more innovative places. They absolutely do. Mm-hmm. But, and, and when we, like when, one of the things that I really try to do with innovators mindset was really get people to think about innovation as a way of thinking, not a technology, but it's also kind of leading to like, Hey, I actually used to use this practice 20 years ago. And I bet you this would work amazing with this kid and yeah. understanding that, that it's, it's not about, Oh, look at all the cool and fancy things I'm doing. It's about like, how are you actually helping kids? And some of those, those old school things work amazingly well with students. And I've, I like, I, I had thought about it a lot before I saw you speak and you shared it. And then I really started to kind of dig into that. And I like very cognizant now, do not say traditional when you mean bad, because there are things that are bad teaching practice. Right. Like there are things that like, no, I don't want you doing that, you know, with my daughter. And I don't like, I don't care if it's new or old. Right. But we have to identify between the two. Now you actually have a new book coming out and it'll be out really, really soon. And you actually wrote this one with your wife, Molly Kieschnick. Yes. Well done. You got it again. Nice. (laughs) Just killing it. And it's actually called Breaking Bold. Now, is it like a sequel? Is it like, tell, tell us about the book. Actually, before you tell us about the book, so what's it like writing with your wife? Well, first things first, we're still married, so that's a win. Um, I, I would not recommend it. Uh, we are married, we parent together, we host a podcast together, and we decided to write a book together. Uh, and I, I think I even wrote in the dedication, I was just like, I love you so much, let's never do this again. Um, uh, it was... It was challenging, but in all the ways that are good, right? Because in Breaking Bold, we got to look at uh, things through multiple lenses, not just through the eyes of an educator, but through the eyes of parents too. And so you asked, is, is Breaking Bold a sequel? Uh, the answer is not really. Um, it, it comes out of the same mindset of, hey, what does it look like when you take uh, things that are old and you blend them with new methodologies? And I realized that when I wrote Bold School, I talked a ton about strategies and I talked a lot about tools and we talked about pedagogy, but the things that we don't talk about in bold school, we don't talk about relationships and we don't talk about social emotional learning. Mm -hmm. And within the context of a future focused classroom, especially now in the age of pandemic, like those things are going to be to emerge as being more important than ever Mm -hmm. because the gift that we got before pandemic, before our kids all left was our kids left school in March. 
And so we had had this long history of relationships that we had built with them over the course of the year, and then they went home. And so those relationships are the things that are carrying us through. It's not the academics, it's relationships. Mm -hmm. And as we start to think about going back to school, the fact of the matter is many of our schools are gonna to have to go back in hybrid models where our touch points with kids are gonna be fewer than ever before and our proximity to kids is gonna be less than it ever was before. And as such, those relationships are going to be more important than ever before because relationships are the driver. And so when you start to look at relationships and SEL, what we discovered when you look at your work, when you look at the work coming out of the Gates Foundation, you look at Brene Brown's work, my wife and I did this sort of meta-analysis of like all of the work that's being done on relationships. And what we discovered was when you look at all of that work, there are 12 habits that bubble up of people who are highly effective at cultivating relationships with kids in masterful classrooms. We said, here's what these are, here's how we replicate them in a future-focused classroom, and at the end of every single chapter, uh, we offer up a self-assessment and a student assessment tool. Because I think one of the dumbest things that we do is we, at, we ask each other like, hey, how do we think we're doing at building relationships with kids? Let's go ask them. Mm -hmm. Like, let's be brave and vulnerable enough to ask the kids like, hey, how are we doing in the realm of like, do you think your teacher believes in you? Uh, does your teacher model, uh, uh, model vulnerability? Uh, do you think your teacher is a trustworthy person? And so we ask our kids to anonymously answer some really difficult questions that will lead us all the way back to what we said at the beginning of the podcast to some of that sometimes tough to hear feedback that will only make us better. Like the one thing, the, like you said, a lot of interesting things, but the one thing that really resonated with me and I hadn't thought about like, what if this happened in September or October mm -hmm. and how different that would be for kids, but also really the probably, yeah, I know that this is not true in all cases, but it would be way harder right now with your students if you didn't focus on building relationships throughout the year, because it's way easier to check out. Right, like, oh, my Wi-Fi doesn't work. Uh, my sister was on a Zoom call and I didn't have access. Like, there's there's ways you can get out of it easier right now. And I think that that really kind of struck some a chord with me is really how important that is, and that so many educators had that time and like is, it, to find a blessing in such a horrible situation. It, is that if this would have happened at a different earlier time of the year, it'd be way harder for people. I think it's an important realization that we all need to have that, you know, if you're a high school kid and you're jumping on Zoom with your teacher, chances are it's not because you care about calculus. It's because you care about the relationship that you have right. with your teacher. And that's the thing that draws you to that medium. Because otherwise, in the space of removed accountability, like we talked about earlier, you really don't have to if you don't want to. Well, and that was actually like one of the things that I didn't talk about in the podcast that I thought about when I, I read your tweet is we know that this is a reality is that we can use like we can use grades as a, a, a motivator for kids we try to utilize that but then when those things are removed and kids like well like now we have to actually make sure the learning really matters and it's purposeful and that we have a relationship and yeah. so like really the accountability you know as we said you know really gets us to focus on what really matters at that time uh the the last thing i'm gonna ask you weston and uh, like, I'm really excited for your book and I'm really excited for the collaboration with uh, your wife, Molly Kieschnick. <laughs> so good. So good. Just mastered it. I'm just, yeah, I gotta, it's yeah. repetition matters. Now, right? now that's, you're a, just, that's a traditional now you're, practice that actually is still beneficial. Still yeah. works. And now, and now you're just showing off, man. You're just killing it. <laughs> I like, I'm going to get a skateboard and do it. <laughs> just like do tricks. I'd like to see that. Make, the, make that <laughs> yeah. your next tweet. Okay. <laughs> yeah. And then you're going to podcast then, one five and, days later and then i'll think about like, i'm never later. tweeting again by the way <laughs> i'm never tweeting again yeah Cause, i was thinking about what you said two years ago yes because because i also have a podcast where my wife and i will <laughs> tag team on let's ah! pick apart this thing george stop said it, stop yeah it. okay no it's good yeah well i only said it because i knew i knew you and again knew what you, you what you said was kind and we agree on it oh i know i know anyways what is your best advice to educators right now, what they're going through? Oh, best advice for educators right now uh, is, is all around patience, right? Uh, be, patience with your, be patient with your kids and be patient with yourselves. Um, so I've had so many conversations with so many teachers and the thing that I hear really frequently is like, ah, I, just, I just don't feel like I'm doing it right. Well, well, of course you don't feel like you're doing it right. 
you feel like that first year teacher that you and I talked about that we were. Like, it feels exactly like that. And I think the, the important uh, advice that I would give is like, just remember, like, you don't have to be great at this tomorrow. All you have to be tomorrow is a little bit better than you were today. And if we just work towards being a little bit better, like we're, we're gonna get good at this. We're gonna develop competency and uh, our kids are okay. As long as we love our kids and we focus on those relationships with kids, like the kids will be okay. Uh, the, the academics will come, like we'll, we'll fill in those gaps and we'll, we'll make sure we pick it up. Just take a breath. It will never be harder than it is right now. I, I think as, as I'm listening to you, really how many of us are being thrust into the role of learner right now and how empathetic we should be of our kids who struggle with, you know, new things every single day in school, pandemic or not, right? Like that is um, when we have kids who struggle with concepts, understanding like, hey, when you struggled, how did you feel through that time? And I think that's I think a really good lesson for us. Yeah, I think, it's, I think it's good for all of us to reconnect to what it feels like to be a learner again. Uh, the vulnerability that's sometimes associated, not sometimes, that's always associated with being a learner. And sometimes like asking ourselves like, hey, in the space of that vulnerability, like to borrow from Brene Brown, like do we default to shame? And if so, like recognizing that that has the potential to show up for our kids every single day. And so connect with that feeling, like marinate in it, so that when we get back with children, either in the virtual hybrid uh, or a face-to-face -face environment, like we're better equipped to deal with that vulnerability, with that shame, because uh, it, it's gonna allow us all to be better. Well, Weston, thank you so much on such short notice to actually do the podcast. And I, I really appreciate you. I think I just admire all the stuff you do and I love getting to connect with you. I can't wait to see you face-to-face because -face, uh, I, We'll be excited that I could cross the border again because I'm not allowed to. <laughs> I know. It's not just seeing you, which would also be great, but also yeah. being allowed to travel outside of my country would also be nice. Also, be Thank great. you so much. And uh, make sure you connect with Weston. Uh, I'm going to share his, uh, his Twitter and Instagram in the, in the profile links. But check out Bold School and Breaking Bold will be out middle of June or a little bit sooner. Uh, yeah, middle, middle to late June. Yeah, yeah, so I, I'm really looking forward to it. Give my best to Molly Kieschnick. Your yes, Kieschnick. You, got, you got in one last one. Hey, George, <laughs> thank, George thank you so much, buddy. I, I appreciate you. Thank you for Thanks, all that brother. you're doing to just put positivity uh, out into the education space and help us to all uh, be better than we were yesterday. Uh, I can't thank you enough. This was great. It's always a pleasure to talk to you, man. But, but truly, thanks for everything that you put out there. Uh, for all of us to help us continue to learn and grow. I really appreciate it. Thanks, brother. Appreciate it. Okay, connect with Weston. Thanks for taking the time to listen. Have a wonderful day.